Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Las Cruces. We welcome those of you who are in our sanctuary this morning and those who are joining us through Zooming technology. James Caulfield is our service leader and I'm Katia Gonzalez, your service associate. Our greeters today are Jack Welch, Carol Stanfill, and John Seeley. Madding, managing our technology are Elwyn Nunn on camera and Mike Yasko and Claire Neal Wallace handling video streaming and audio. The Board of Trustees is offering hospitality after the service. All of us are delighted to be with you today. Unitarian Universalism has no creed or dogma. We are a covenant-based church, meaning that we agree to live in relationship with each other according to the Unitarian Universalist principles and our congregation's covenant of right relations. We embrace diversity in all its forms and everyone is welcome. You can learn more about our church at our website, uuchurchlc.org. Okay. If you are visiting us today, we'd like to meet you. If you're in the sanctuary, please rise in body or spirit to introduce yourself by telling us your name and where you are from. Please wait until we bring the mic to you. Do we have any visitors in the sanctuary today? My name is Mary, and I'm here, just moved here, but I belong to the Unitarian Universalist Church in Boulder. Anyone else? I'm going to introduce my neighbor. She doesn't have to stand. <laughs> this is my friend and neighbor, Alta, and I'm so glad she came today. <laughs> and she knows a few of you already from, from visiting. Um, so if you are joining us on Zoom, please turn on your mic and camera in order to introduce yourself. Are there any visitors joining us on Zoom today? No? I'm, I'm looking around. No? <laughs> okay. So thank you. We are so pleased that you have joined us today. Please fill out a visitor's card and drop it in the collection plate or leave your email address in the Zoom chat box so that we can invite you to other services and activities at the church. Everyone is invited to attend coffee and conversation after the service just down the breezeway and outside the religious education building. If you're joining us on Zoom, please participate in a chat room after the service. Hello, I'm James Caulfield, but you all know me, don't you? Um, okay, if I tell a joke. <clears throat> How many climate change deniers does it take to change a light bulb? There's nothing wrong with that light bulb. <laughs> Why did more than 600 oil fossil fuel lobbyists attend COP27 in Egypt. They wanted to be in the state of denial. That's all the pain I'll inflict on you for right now. <laughs> Opening words. Good news, glad tidings. The history of the climate crisis has been one of delay, denial, and a listing of the reasons why it is not possible to make the changes required. But in the last decade, the technology has proved, improved far more quickly than predicted. Suddenly, we found that we could indeed think about mass producing green technology and saving the planet. The sticking point was the cost. How in the world are we going to pay for the rebuilding of so many buildings, so much transport, so much production? the world dithered for a few years longer. 
But now there is truly good tidings. Now the matter isn't completely settled, but researchers from Oxford University said that shifting the global economy to a low carbon footing would actually save the world at least 12 trillion by 2050 compared with current levels of fossil fuel use. The study published in the journal Juul this September found that moving rapidly to renewable power and other forms of clean energy would benefit the economy as the costs of green technology have plummeted. If this is indeed correct, then it seems that the last major obstacle to climate change action has been removed. I do not know of any reasonable arguments against a massive green rebuilding of the world, and that is good news indeed. Our chalice-lighting words come from the great Muslim scholar and mystic, Ibn Arabi. Do not praise your faith so exclusively that you disbelieve all the rest. If you do this, you will fail to recognize the real truth of the matter. God, the omnipresent and omnipotent, cannot be confined to any one creed, for he says, Whosoever ye turn, or wheresoever ye turn, there is the face of Allah. Quran chapter 2, verse 115. Everyone praises what he believes. His God is his own creature, and in praising it, he praises himself. Consequently, he blames the beliefs of others, which he would not do if he were just. But his dislike is based on ignorance. May the light of this chalice allow us to see through ignorance to wisdom and justice. May it widen our hearts. May it illuminate the greater truth. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in saying our church's affirmation of covenant, followed by the doxology in English and Spanish. Love is the doctrine of this truth. The quest of truth is our sacrament, and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve others in community, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with creation, thus do we covenant with one another. The three little piggies couldn't make it today, but in their stead, we have detector time. Uh, I don't know if there are any children in the place here to come forward and hang out with detector, detector man, which I have now become. I've been terrorizing people with this for, well, a couple months since I've had it. It's a CO2 meter. Um, as well as a PM 2.5 meter. Let's see, you all know what PM 2.5 is? 
that, so it's uh, particles of two nanometers, 2.5 nanometers or less. I'm getting some nods, so I got that right. Uh, it's really small stuff, so it's junk that comes out of diesel, burning fossil fuels mostly. Um, there's also PM10, which is a bigger particle, but that's not so harmful. The harmful thing about PM2.5 is that it goes straight through our lungs and into our blood system, and then is deposited in our various organs. Now, the thing is, of course, that's not good for us, and then we end up saying, oh, he died of a heart attack, or he died of mm, Alzheimer's, you know, something. But then when, if, they, if they do the autopsy, and I think it's difficult to do, they find, oh, PM2.5 built up. It's extremely bad. Huge reduction in intelligence is the headline. You do not want to breathe, breathe PM2.5. Right now we're breathing carbon dioxide as well as oxygen and nitrogen. Can you see the meter here, Elwin? A big time zoom on this one. I'll hold it steady on the thing. We're at 1,006. We were at about 600 when we came into the sanctuary at about 940 or so, and the choir was already singing. Um, you can, the science is fabulous. You can tell uh, per person the output of CO2. I know what each person is producing. <laughs> and of course, I want to go around and point this thing at, at people and set it off. Dee, 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 dee. I did turn off the alarm because the, al the alarm has al would have already gone off. This drives Katya crazy. She hates to hear this sound. And of course, then I'm opening all the windows and, you know, whatever. It's quite surprising. Oops, sorry. Uh, menu. Turn off alarm. There we go. So... Uh, now, uh, if you're into reading about it, the Germans, of course, are very scientific about these things. They have developed systems for singing in choirs. They put up a bunch of sensors. They get up to 800. The choir leaves the room. They open the doors and the windows. The shock air it out, bring it back down to 400, which is ambient, right? And then they close it and bring people back in to sing. That's the way they try to stay safe. This is a, that's because CO2 is a proxy for COVID danger. The higher this gets, the more you're breathing air that other people have breathed. So, cheery things, huh? <clears throat> but, may I have my filter please? And we could conduct an experiment right now. Uh, you see over here, my lovely assistant has <laughs> a furnace filter and we could conduct an experiment with all of those candles there because candles are hydrocarbons which will produce smoke, smoke actually yes they will and a lot of PM 2.5 and so you could actually we could turn it on we could we could light those and watch this climb uh, we're now at 1309 unhealthy for sensitive groups and we're, we're climbing still. Um, so the MERV-13 filter, oh, you put it away already. Oh, well, so let's see, MERV-13 is a standard of filtration. It's able to take out 2.5, and it's able to take out COVID. Hospitals run a little higher standard. They run MERV-71, I don't know what it is, 16, 15, something. <laughs> <laughs> you look good standing there. Okay, that's fine. I guess that's fine. So the thing's four inches thick, you might notice. That's because it reduces, if it's that thick, it reduces the pressure required to push air through. You can get MERV, fil MERV 13 filters that are one inch thick, but if you put them into a standard furnace, they, will, they, they have too much resistance. They will burn out your fan. So you need a box that's four inches thick, uh, and most buildings do not have that, by the way. And a couple of stories about Detecto Man. Uh, well, one or two. Let's see. 
Katya and I got some ultrasonic humidifiers. How many have those? And you pour water in and you plug it in and it's very quiet and it works nicely, except I was wondering what's going on. Our, our stove was burning orange flame. And I looked it up online and said, well, your burner is mismatched. It's not set right. And so I went back to the stove and it was like, wait a minute, all of them are burning that way. And I'm supposed to fix one burner? No, this is something else. So either it's in the gas line or it's in the air. So then I did some searching and it was actually very hard to find, but there was a reference to this. Basically what the ultrasonic humidifiers do is they put everything into the air that's in the water, including PM 2.5. Indeed, <laughs> PM 2.5, which is really bad for you. By the way, the standard in the U.S. is now 12. Mm, you're going to go to squared. <coughs> 12. The WHO has recently said, no, we know that five is dangerous, and f less than five might still be dangerous. Five is not your lower limit. You're not safe. So we were getting screaming high levels of you know, hundreds of PM 2.5 particles per meter squared, I think it was. And um, so we began using distilled water in the humidifiers. That cures it. That is what you want to do. The other night, God, just tell me to wrap it up. So the other night, um, <laughs> the other night, I was, we were going to bed and I'm looking at the, and I said, well, why is the meter so high for PM 2.5? And I reach over and turn on the stove and it burns orange. And I turn to Katya and I say, busted. You put regular water into the humidifier. <laughs> These are the sorts of things you can do to people when you have meters like this. Those are the adventures of Meter Man. Opening hymn is number 1066, O Brother Son. I invite you to rise in body or spirit to sing together.
one of the ways that we support one another in this community is through the sharing of joys, sorrows, and milestones. It's one way for us to stay connected in these challenging times. <laughs> so now I will uh, bring around a microphone if you have a joy or sorrow or milestone that you would like to share. Um, and a gentle reminder, this is not a time for announcements. And I'm gonna start since I have the mic. I'm so happy to see Alta and Jeff today here in the, in the sanctuary. Uh, my name is Jack Welch, <coughs> and I have a joy. I recently spoke with our church patriarch, Clayton Flowers, who three weeks from today will be 107 years old. Now, <coughs> you heard me right, 107. Clayton has help in his home for one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening, otherwise he lives independently. He told me that he, he, he's very much engaged in the world. He voted in the last election. And when he sent his pledge in for the donation this year, as he does every year, he designated for the youth because when he was active in the church a few decades ago, he was the director of religious education. So uh, three weeks from today, send, he's in our church directory. Send him a card. Clayton Flowers. One of my uh, favorite musicians uh, recently passed. Uh, Christine McVie played piano, notably for, um, what is that? Thank you very much. But she, although supposedly a rock and roller, she didn't go screaming and hollering at people. She wrote beautiful music, and she sang um, very beautiful. I like, she was my favorite singer, especially in that group. So now I will light a candle to uplift the joys and sorrows spoken today and all of those that remain in our hearts. So please hold everyone in your hearts in celebration, in compassion, and in love. We speak our joys and sorrows so that others will know something of our inner state and something about our outer ambitions, our achievements, our setbacks. So we lift up Clayton, who has made it to 107. And we are glad that Alta's here, Jeff's here. And we are sad for Fleetwood Mac's beloved singer. We keep our joys and sorrows to ourselves when they are too immense or too sensitive for us to, to imagine that they will be heard or understood by others. And since we have some things of this kind, each of us, let's take a moment of silence to reflect upon those things not said. And so it is. Our opening, our reading today is a poem by Drew Dellinger. What did you do when you knew? It's 3.23 in the morning and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren 
won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something when the seasons started failing, as the mammals, reptiles, birds were all dying. Did you fill the streets with protest when democracy was stolen? What did you do once you knew? Even though this is really an anthem by the choir, we invite you to join in singing with us. We'll preview the chorus so that you'll be able to sing that, and then we'll sing it all the way through, and the lyrics will be up there, so we invite you to join us.
great to hear all these songs that are talking about the right things. Um, the climate crisis, a moral question for all time. A little history of this title. Uh, at first I was saying climate crisis an update. And Lynn Pearson said, you can't just say that. And so she changed it to climate crisis, a moral issue for our time. And I said, Lynn, you can't change it to that. It's got to be a moral crisis for all time, because I'm afraid that's the stakes. Um, those, uh, the first hymn we sang uh, were the words of St. Francis of Assisi, and of course, Pope Francis is named after him and is doing uh, environmental work. If you haven't read the Pope's encyclical, I read it fairly recently, and it's great. It's hard to believe. You're just like, okay, yep, yep. And I also read um, the Dalai Lama's got a book out, too, on this. <clears throat> I suspect pretty much every religious leader does. Big change is coming, whether we like it or not. We are shockingly close to sliding over the edge into climate catastrophe. But we are also shockingly close to making huge steps to solve the problem. The outcome is still uncertain. The climate crisis is a moral crisis, and it's one that the ancients could not know about. The bad news is very bad indeed, as we are approaching five tipping points. Our responsibility for these is a moral question for all time because once any of these tipping points is passed, there will be no going back. We will not be able to put the methane back into the permafrost. We probably can't restore the Amazon rainforest, nor is it likely we can restart the ocean circulation systems that have existed for eons. All of these problems are coming on quicker than ever predicted and often the news is worse than even the worst case scenarios. These thoughts are almost unbearably painful to think, yet think about these things we must. As I was doing research for the recent roundtable on reducing your carbon footprint, uh, I came across one photo after another of the world's great rivers drying up. Not just our beloved Rio Grande, the Colorado, the Mississippi, the Rhine, the Loire, the Danube, the Tiber, the Po, the Elba, the Volga, the Yangtze, and the list goes on. Seeing those photos was a stab in the heart. Yet we should make room in our hearts for these visions of dry rivers so we can be witnesses in spite of the pain because we love the world. If you stopped paying attention because the news is so bad, then you might not have noticed that the news is also very, very good. And although bad things are happening faster than ever expected, the same is true of the good things. Green technology keeps getting better and cheaper, cheaper than oil, cheaper than coal, cheaper than nuclear, so much cheaper that there are now academic papers plausibly arguing that it, we can convert pretty much everything to green energy and it won't be the terrible expense we expected. It will actually save us money. That's our opening reading. If that is true, then the last major barrier to a green transition has fallen and the race will be on to build a green infrastructure as quickly as possible. So I think it's time for us to try to pay attention to the news and try to help. To be useful in this time, we may need new virtues. I was just mentioning taking in the pain of those photos. We may need to widen our hearts and pay attention to the pain of the world so we can also see and protect its potential. Absorbing this news is perhaps the most important thing we can do now. Yes, we tend to shy away from bad news, Another limitation is that we tend to be very short-sighted, talking about the situation in 2050 or 2100 as if the story stops there. But geological time works on the scale of millions of years. Let's try to get some perspective. If 
we assume a generation is 20 years, then Homo sapiens has been around for maybe 10,000 generations, give or take 5,000. <laughs> it depends on how you define Homo sapiens. But about eight generations ago, at the time of the US Civil War, just eight generations ago, we were still working with horsepower and sail. Only four generations later, we detonated the first atom bomb. And only one generation after that, there were 50 some thousand nuclear weapons between the United States and the USSR, enough to maybe destroy the whole world or at least civilization. This incredible power and responsibility is something very new to our species. And there are unfortunately other examples. Toby Ord, a philosopher at Oxford, considers not just the risks of climate change and nuclear weapons, but also of deadly pathogens that could escape from laboratories and, su and the surprisingly high danger of an artificial intelligence apocalypse. So we can worry about those things too. <laughs> so if humans have been around for 5,000, 10,000 generations, how many more generations can we expect? Mr. Ord of Oxford does some calculations of the various risks, killer asteroid, exploding sun, all that sort of stuff, and finds that if we don't count the humanly caused self-destruction, we should be able to stick around for another billion years. The sun will allow that long life that long on the earth. We're, uh, for according to his calculations, we're a hundred times more likely to do ourselves in than to be, have some natural thing happen to us. Okay, a billion years. Allowing for 20 years per generation, that would be maybe 50 million more generations still to come. As Ord puts it, because almost all of humanity's life lies in the future, almost everything of value lies in the future as well. Almost all the flourishing, Almost all the beauty, our greatest achievements, our most just societies, our most profound discuss discoveries. If we protect the world from catastrophe, it could last millions of centuries. This is our potential. This is what we could achieve if we pass the precipice and continue to strive for a better world. It's absolutely amazing that we are the generation facing these problems and that we are responsible for protecting the potential of humanity and the planet. As Ord says, our actions can have sustained positive effects over the whole long-term future, billion years, and we are the only generation in a position to produce those effects. <clears throat> Another philosopher, Kathleen Dean Moore, wrote in 2016, we're alive at the most extraordinary point in human history. Climatologists say we can avoid catastrophe by cutting global emissions 6% per year starting today. President Obama said the same thing in effect. We are the first generation to feel the effect of climate change and we are the last generation who can do something about it. How well are we meeting this responsibility? The Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, says, we are in the fight of our lives and we are losing. Greenhouse gas emissions are growing. Temperatures keep rising and our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. We are on a highway to hell with our foot on the accelerator. These were his opening words at COP27, just concluded in Egypt. Einstein famously talked about how our technical powers have grown enormously, the atom bomb, but our moral powers have not. And thinkers like Toby Ord, the guy I was just talking about, and this guy David Orr, talk about the dangerous years, how our species is, as it were, teenagers. Here's the keys to the car. There's the nuclear launch button, don't touch that. <coughs> By the way, I do recommend 
Toby Ord's book, The Precipice, the guy from uh, Oxford, because although he's, he is talking about potential extinction events, he manages to make the climate crisis into the boring kind of administrative job that it really should be. That's instead of the insane, white-knuckled game of chicken we are currently playing against the planet Earth. Ord's metaphor is that we are standing on the precipice, very much in danger of falling off. But maybe a better analogy is to the Titanic, because so many parts of that story correspond to our current problems. As the name of the ship implies, it embodied powers previously unthinkable. And that is our general problem, that we have such enormous powers. The most important part of the Titanic story might not be so well known. Namely, how the institutions of the ship were not configured so as to responsibly handle this mighty new power. As the Titanic entered the fatal ice field at full speed, a nearby ship blasted a telegraph warning of danger to the radio operator on the Titanic. The response from the radio operator on the Titanic, shut up, shut up, all caps. The captain was not told of this warning. To us, this seems unbelievable. They had other problems, by the way. The captain had been told earlier, so it wasn't just the radio operator. To us, this seems unbelievable. We assume a warning of great danger will be, Im be immediately sent up, the chain, sent up the chain of command. But in those days, the operator, radio operator was not in the chain of command. losing my voice here. So the radio operator was not in the chain of command. He was working for a private radio company, the Marconi Company. He was sending and receiving messages for some of the world's most powerful and richest people. I imagine there would have been hell to pay if the radio operator had not transmitted this or that order to sell this stock or buy that stock. And so the radio operator told the other guy, warning him, Shut up. One in, another interesting detail of this story is that of the first class passengers, 74% of the women survived, but only 20% of the men. What does that mean? This disparity is because some of the richest men in the world allowed women and children to board the lifeboats instead of them. I find it significant that the most powerful people in the world gave their lives trying to do the right thing. But somehow this ethical dedication did not translate into the most important moral task, namely seeing that these lives were never put in danger in the first place. The Titanic sank for want of new morals and new institutions that could match its new powers. We in the early 2020s have a similar difficulty as somehow the message of danger doesn't get through. How can it be that most people don't know we are dangerously close to five tipping points, any of which will trigger irreversible climate change? And why is it the responsibility of each private person to seek out such information when this knowledge is clearly vital to our world? Part of the problem is that there are many rational reasons for not being rational about the climate crisis. Take, for example, a politician. Let's say she is certain that a carbon tax is the most rational step to head off the disaster. But she also knows that only 30% of the population supports it. She wants to get elected, so it makes sense for her to deny the problem or at least not highlight it. What about the news channels? They will surely find that this depressing news drives down their ratings, as you and I can only stand so much, and we will quickly change the channels. And so we are left in a situation where politicians need more support to act, but news organizations don't get the message out, so people don't know. It's as if the captain of the Titanic knows there's an iceberg ahead and very much wants to turn the ship, but only has the support of some 30% of the passengers. He needs more than 50% of the vote to act. So here's another 
new virtue that's also very old, we need to tell the truth now, even if it is not popular. And this example also illustrates why we need to think about how we can make our institutions equal to our current problems. We often say that the climate crisis is an existential crisis. I take this to mean several things. Yes, it is a question of whether and how we will exist as a species. But there is also a school of philosophical thinking called existential philosophy. And that demands we take responsibility for what we have done and built. The climate crisis did not just happen, humans made it happen. We can forget this truth. A recent headline proclaimed, the preppers were right all along, which seems to imply that anyone who thought otherwise was simply mistaken about a factual truth. By this reasoning, the preppers simply predicted a factual event, and now they have been proven right. But existential philosophy forbids this evasion of responsibility. I would go so far as to argue that preparations for doomsday have actually helped create the looming disaster. After all, the billions spent on shelters and supplies are billions that were not spent on avoiding the problem in the first place. And if you invested a lot in prepping and think maybe you will be safe for at least a while, then maybe you're not quite as ready to help solve the bigger problems. To go back to the Titanic analogy, the ship is not yet wrecked yet, but everyone is spending way too much time and money on their private lifeboats and not enough on trying to save the ship. Let's talk about denial. <clears throat> the science is very strong, yet there is still denial on very many levels. First, I think it's important to acknowledge that we're all in denial because none of us can truly admit the monstrosity of this truth. It's huge, it involves the whole world, and it's awful. Mostly, denial comes down to motivated reasoning, where our motives precede the conclusions. Our motives determine what information we will seek, what sources we will trust, what we count as proof or disproof, and when we shall stop seeking and consider the answer good enough. Motivated cognition becomes especially strong when information threatens a person's identity, which brings us to another sense of the words existential threat. Strictly speaking, this term only applies to threats to the whole of humanity. But individuals can feel something similar. We talk about the need to stop releasing CO2 and how some industries are obviously problems, and then we leave it at that, mostly. But lots of people work very hard and earn good money in oil fields, and for them, the Cummins diesel is like their right arm, as this is the pickup truck in general. Raising cattle is a way of life, as we well know in New Mexico. And now we are going to talk about regulating all these things? This is already starting to sound like a country song. <laughs> At least we can have our dogs, right? Wait, a big dog needs food that produces a ton of carbon per year, quite a bit. So with these kinds of worries, is it any wonder that some, feel, some people feel their identity is being threatened? When liberals, when we liberals say that truth is so simple, it might involve some ignorance on our part and some closed hearts. We call for change and condemn denial, but mostly without any recognition of those whose whole way of life is under threat. If we want to help people get past denial, we might need to make some existential promises to allay that threat. I need to disallow one obvious biblical reference. Some say these are apocalyptic times and surely we should turn to the last book in the Bible for guidance. After all, the argument goes, every year seems to be a record year for forest fires. Melting glaciers are releasing pestilence that hasn't been out for millennia. Crops are failing, there's starvation in the Horn of Africa right now and was in Pakistan and still is er, this year before one third of Pakistan was flooded one third of the country was covered by floods. Are these not the sort of events that were predicted by the Bible? <clears throat> to that I have to say, no, they are not. 
The biblical events were brought about by God, and humans were not responsible for trying to stop them. But our situation is different. We cannot honestly say that these things were caused by God, nor deny our responsibility. You can't hide something under a rock and then pull the rock away and say, God put it there. <laughs> Ditto CO2 in the atmosphere. We knew and have known for more than 30 years how dangerous it is to do that. So I'm listing our psychological failings, the things we need to try to compensate for. Uh, another psychological failing Another psychological failing is a tendency to create in-groups and out-groups. And it is well known that these opposed groups become more extreme. A few months back, I received a campaign advertisement claiming that Nathan Small was the pro-fentanyl candidate. Go, Nathan. <laughs> and I actually wanted to send him an email uh, seeing if he could fix me up. And, and, and Katya said, you'd better not do that because the police will come. And I thought, that's, I can't even make a joke. Uh, okay. So, so media outlets and politicians compete with ever more extreme messages. And, of course, online algorithms promote the controversy. Our shared reality is splitting apart. So part of the work we need to do is to try to put these pieces back together or at least ease the separating logic of in-groups and out-groups. Who would you let into your climate shelter? Only people who share your values and who believe what you believe? For better or worse, I'm inclined to be more Christian, to think that people who think differently, quite possibly myself, are only in error. After all, they are only looking for a climate shelter. Since they are looking for a climate shelter, they probably aren't climate change deniers anymore. And, since we're talking about good and bad news, I still tend to believe the existential Christian good news, that if we try to love each other, we will make the world a better place. So it looks like, well, we have some good old institutions, but we need new ones. We need some new institutions, some new information, and some new virtues. Several African countries, such as Ghana and the Democratic Republic of Congo, are poised to become petrostates. Their reserves have been proven, and they are ready to bring big companies in to cut down the forests and start pumping oil. They can make money that way, but the world's carbon budget will be blown. So it is very much in our interest to help them to develop green resources instead. Just as green energy is a good investment here, so it is in other countries. Bill McKibben writes about how institutions such as the World Bank and the IMF are developing new processes and rules to help make such investments safe so that we can invest in Africa and build green there instead of letting them build oil. Oh, gosh. Another psychological failing is we have so many psychological failings, it's kind of crazy. How are we ever going to get through this? And I think we have to learn these psychological failings. We have an irrational fear of loss as compared to what we gain. <clears throat> and we can see very easily what goods we have, and we cannot see climate loss so well. I can see my car. I know it runs well. I can see the airplane that, that will take me to see my family at, at Christmas. Uh, these are very easy to see and very hard to think about changing. By contrast, the losses of climate change are mostly to come. They remain hidden by difficulties of perception, by time, by distance, and by our forgetfulness. So we can't see, and we also, even if we did see, we tend to not think rationally. So this leaves us in a situation where we we doubt that the future will be a good one. It's an existential question, I think. It's not simply a factual question, what the future will be like. It's a reality that we're going to create. And now we know that people value things that they fear losing more than even if they're offered something equal to gain. 
we have this bias, how can we help these people see that the change will actually be good? And it also it's an invisible thing. We, we don't see the loss of climate. One of our spiritual jobs now is to help people envision and create a good future. If we're going to take a step away from one known good thing, we need to see that there is a good thing where we are going to. So let's dream about the nice thing the future might bring. If you need a big work truck, there's a $43,000 government subsidy for a class four electric truck or work vehicle. I think it's a pretty good deal. I think that's about a third of the price, maybe more. I have an electric bike that pretty much powers itself. And I have a scheme for towing a wheelchair. So I dream of a nice set of safe bike paths through Las Cruces, making it possible for me to go safely pretty much everywhere with almost no fuel. I remember talking to a woman from this church who, when she was young, used to ride horses up Alameda and El Paseo and then head up to Dripping Springs for the day. When exactly did we stop riding horses in town? And if we're going to start dreaming about things, what would it take to make some horse paths so it's possible to safely commute to work in, on a horse in Las Cruces? Wouldn't that be cool? I mean, that would put us on the national stage. And it would also be like a, a little something for people who have horses. I mean, what about a city filled with native trees that feed the bugs and the birds? Trees reduce summer heat by 5 to 15 degrees. They raise property values. There's a clear association between trees and mental and physical health. And, weirdly enough, for unexplained reasons, trees are very effective at reducing crime, almost certainly more cost-effective than adding police. There is one part of Las Cruces that has already deliberately planted trees. I forget the name of it. What about an ancient technology to cool our city? I'm just making things up, but I'm trying, right? These are things that might work. There are things called canats, K-A, sorry, Q-A-N-A-T, Remember that next time you're playing Scrabble. <coughs> <laughs> Underground channels of water that have been used for cooling in the Middle East for thousands of years. And we can even see that in 500 BC, the Achaemenid Empire granted tax rebates for five generations if you built one of these things. So they were doing tax rebates ba back then. <laughs> so uh, NMSU engineering students compete nationally uh, uh, to build cement canoes, and they are very good at it. But uh, this is the same problem our society faces as a whole. We can build fabulous internal combustion engines, for instance, but we really don't need them now. So the same can be said for cement canoes. But we do need sustainable housing that doesn't use a lot of oil and gas. I would like to see NMSU students competing for that practical goal, even if they don't win. There is such a competition. I think it would cost ten or 20000 for them to go. It's not that expensive. Uh, I would like Las Cruces to have a school like Atrisco in Albuquerque. I'm going to talk about that in just a second as I'm finishing up. Those are some of my dreams for, the, for Las Cruces. I spoke about how we have a hard time remembering things a moment ago. Do you remember the great Northwest heat wave of 2021? Temperatures went up to 121 degrees in Canada. Canada. The heat dried things out, and then the forests and the towns burned. This, by the way, would not have been possible without climate change. The science knows that this is the root. If it can happen in Canada, it can happen here. You might also know that the combination of blackouts and extreme heat may be the deadliest climate-related event we can imagine. One study found that all 1.7 million residents of Phoenix are at risk of deadly heat during a power failure, and I imagine Las Cruces is similar. Cities have cooling centers that usually can take about 2% of the population, but nationwide, almost none are independent of the grid. I don't think we have any here in Las Cruces. But up the road a ways, in Albuquerque, there is a Trisco High School it has solar panels, it has batteries, and it is designed to work off-grid as a resilience center. 
the building checks all the boxes. It will save lives during a power failure, it saves the planet by not using fossil fuels, and it saves money. What a no-brainer. So we can save ourselves, we can save the planet, and we can save money. And if those things aren't enough to convince you to go in that direction with building, it seems that the decline in health expenses due to pollution would all by itself pay for the expenses of green conversion. In other words, our medical expenses are huge for pollution. So we, Her at Trisco Heritage High School, we need to thank Albuquerque and Sandia Labs for raising a signal to the people. This is how the future can be, and it can be good indeed. Why not build everything like that? Once we see it can be done, everyone will have the faith to support it. And it is a question of faith in our future. Once people have that faith, I think we will see one of the greatest building programs in history, some of which were very competitive. I have some quotes from ancient times. You call that a megalith? <laughs> you call that a pyramid? Ha, Notre Dame, you call that a cathedral? You call that a fast train? Sometimes the competition was ill-conceived. You call that a big bomb? And Russia blows a hole in the atmosphere. Well, so I think it's time to start a new competition. And with all gratitude and respect to Albuquerque and Sandia Labs for showing what can be done and that we should have some faith, let's just add, Albuquerque, you call that a resilience center? <laughs> Thank you. And now is the time for the sharing of gifts. Um, you can, let's see. Um, all through the pandemic, we've continued to support uh, the support organizations identified by the Social Justice Committee as recipients for our Change for Change program. The recipient this quarter is the NAACP of Doniana County. You can make your pledge or donate to the Change for Change by putting checks and change in the basket by sending your checks to the church or by using the give link on your church's website. May there now be an offering to sustain and grow the life and mission of this congregation. May we give with hope and with love. May re we receive with gratitude for the sacrifice and hard work of the giver.
our closing hymn is number 317, We Are Not Our Own. I invite you to rise and body your spirit to sing together. As we go into this holiday season, I can honestly say there are good tidings. There is good news. For it seems that the last major obstacle to climate action has been eliminated. We had the technology for a while. Now it seems like we can afford it. Of course, we could never, af we could never afford not to pay. And any amount spent now will be trivial compared to the benefit over, let's say, 50 million generations. So we find ourselves at a hinge point in history. Successes and failures will become apparent in the next decade or two. There is much that can be done, and we can help by growing our ethics, our institutions, and by widening our hearts to hold the work that needs to be done. Go in peace and keep the faith. a few announcements. Um, the Tombow Gallery will be open after the morning service. There's an exhibit that begins today and ends January 8th. The artists will have a, uh, be present at a special reception on December 11th after the service and before the congregational meeting. There will be a round table today um, for, uh, for the members and friends of the UU Church are invited to participate in a Zoom meeting at right uh, at 2 p.m., the roundtable slot on the calendar. The purpose of the meeting is to present information about charities which have been nominated to receive the Change for Change offerings for the uh, coming five quarters and to hold a poll which will select the top five. Uh, questions about the, Zoom, the selection Zoom should be directed to Dave Rice, chairperson of the Social Justice Committee. Um, that we have initiating a seventh princ principal group, and the first meeting is for Thursday, December 8th at 7 p.m. Um, if please consider reading the most recent copy of the UU World, which is about the climate emergency, and a Zoom link will be forthcoming. Also, please uh, sign up for the circle suppers in the lobby with Lynn. Uh, please join me now in saying the words to extinguish the flame. Oh, wait, did I? More?
Truffles. Truffles after the service. Not samples this week, right? We got to pay this week? Okay. Holiday boxes also outside in the breezeway. Okay, anything else? All right. Now, please join me in saying the words to extinguish the flame. We extinguish this flame.